All right, everybody. My next guest is a very funny comedian based out of Philadelphia. He's a comic, a teacher, an actor. He's been out there on the scene making the rounds. Here he is, folks. Uh, the very funny Jay Yoder. Jay, how you doing, man? Good, Don. I'm so glad to be here. This is great. I'm, I'm excited uh, to be on the show. Yeah, dude, it's awesome to have you on here. I first met you, I'd say, a couple weeks ago, right? When you came to, you came to Long Island with uh, Mark Riccadonna, yeah. the great Mark Riccadonna, man. And uh, uh, yeah, it was awesome, man. Dude, he's great. I'm actually going to be with him tomorrow. We're taking a, we have a show down in Rehoboth together. Nice. So man. I'll be uh, getting some some good road time, which is great because he's a great dude to just chat with. So it's like always fun. Yeah, Mark's a, a great dude, funny guy. He's been around for a while, and uh, and yeah, just a just a all around good dude. Always wants to help people out, man. You know. Yeah, and we have kids the same age and stuff like that, so he always uh, commiserate and uh, <laughs> and all of those <laughs> things as well. So I mean, yeah, what a wealth of information to it. Just I, actually, when we got together at uh, Governor's Club a couple of weeks ago, too, like what a great time just with all of you, Tony, and like just uh just getting to get a glimpse inside of, of that scene for me it was fascinating i had such a great time that was like such an unexpected surprise that day yeah it was cool you never know what's going to take you we were all the way out east originally where you guys like in selden and then uh the library you did like a library performance which was cool because it's always cool for me to, to see um comics who i'm used to seeing in the clubs like rick adana and, and you know working the club vibe and then going into a library where the audience is like <laughs> you know uh older people to say it nicely very uh, you know it, yes it was, it was it was an interesting dynamic for sure for, and that was for me the stark that was the biggest contrast of a show I, i've had to date in terms of you know time setting like yeah it was <laughs> it was interesting yeah because when you do it like when you used to you know when you when you cut your teeth out there in the clubs and then you have to shift gears into something like that. Like, how did you change or alter your set a lot for that particular audience when you're going after, you know, when you should have, for, yeah. should have. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> as like, as I reflected back on it too, like, you know, because you, you don't realize sometimes. And even when you travel outside of your region. So now that I've been working the road and working a couple of different states, it's like you start noticing like, oh, I can't say Wawa. They've never heard of a Wawa here. Or in the case of our library uh, uh, folks, there were certain references that were built within some of my premises that they didn't understand. And if they don't know social media or Instagram, or if I'm talking about what the kids I'm seeing in the classroom are talking about, you know, their grandparents are too far removed, you yeah. know, and the, the Jetsons are over here. The Flintstones are over here and we know they met once and it was a great movie, but they don't usually <laughs> hang out with each other. So, right, right. you know, it's one of those things that every time you get on stage, you learn a lesson and uh, like, you know, it was just a great opportunity and we had a lot of fun, but you're, you kind of see like, Oh wow. That had a different feeling than a club for sure. I mean, you don't have light shine. You don't have natural sunlight shining in or you shouldn't, that would be the worst <laughs> comedy club that ever was created um but yeah it's just a different feel even when you're farther away from the audience you know because that stage you recall was sort of like it was like parents coming to see their kid be tree number four in the recital yeah you know? it was so like it's old, like yeah and now hey don't be wrong like, it was a beautiful for a library i mean my library barely had books so like the fact that they had a stage <laughs> was uh amazing um but it was just it had that kind of you know auditorium feel and it was uh but when you're playing theaters, like I know Mark and I are playing tomorrow in Rehoboth, you kind of have that feel. So it's good to kind of it's good to find a way to break through. And then I mark such a pro with it because he just knows how to needle through and 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 finally break that ice, because that's really what you got to do, yeah. um, which is so fun to watch. Yeah, it definitely was fun watching um, watching you guys adjust to to that audience which you yeah. know like again it was you know mainly older age people 80s and above for the most part yes. i would say and, and but you guys killed they loved you guys they, they loved up. us yeah they yeah. loved us it was fun it just you know it's just a different it's a different vibe but you know what it's entertainment at the end of the day i want people to be happy i want people for the time that we're together to be escaping you know whatever reality because they're gonna have to go back to it and so sometimes we just need a breather we need a break you know and uh and that's what we're trying to provide we're trying to provide that entertainment that helps us get back to the grind of whatever we have to do so that we can do more things we want to do right on man and you're also you're pretty new in in the 
in as far as comedy age goes yes. right you got a few years under your belt now I've, yeah so now i've been very i was sort of the came onto the scene fast and furious it was sort of a uh was something that i had always wanted to do and uh and it just turned out to be i think 18 years of public school teaching you know you have to get these people that these kids that don't even want to be in your class to learn <laughs> certain things so you just learn how to build rapport and you know get a likability i mean that's every every comic that i think is successful has a bit of a superpower and mine often is my ability to just get likability or 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 get buy-in and build rapport quick because i have to with kids of all walks of life because i teach public school you know and i've taught in a bunch of different areas outside of philly so you you know you, you see all walks of life so and to me like that's that's the challenge i love that that's the chess match except you don't know what pieces you're in you teenagers i mean a kid could be a bishop today and a rook tomorrow but a pawn for the rest of the week so it's like <laughs> you don't you know you don't and that's how stand up comedy is it's like you don't know that audience and and that moment and you could have a plan but when you get out there it's all the give and take and that i think the education and coaching and mentoring kids like that's the same because these are those same kids they're just a little older you know right right yeah exactly man and i think too you know you you do have an edge 18 years teaching it's kind of like if you put it in terms of um of karate it's like you've been painting the fence for 18 years yes, and now, yes. You're, now you're an expert and i i mean i, I mean, myself you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah, exactly. i had no idea that this is what this was preparation for but that's what it was you know and i was just tutoring i i tutor on the side i was just uh, before we jumped on here i tutoring a Latin student who I've never met in real life, just another school and Latin, sometimes a hard subject to get people. But, you know, her and I, have we met twice, two different hours times, but even quickly we've built rapport over Zoom. And I, I always will use crazy analogies and like, you know, we're talking about now in an adjective agreement and I'm talking about how, you know, her boyfriend from prom needs to have just a tie that matches her, but she's got to have the dress and the sort. Right, like, so there's right. all these yeah. things that I can relate. So I'm taking these seemingly unrelatable things like Latin now that have to agree with adjectives boring and i'm trying to find a way to like relate it to her in the same way with that show in the library it's all about how quickly can you read your audience and and get them to where you want them to go and so i think that is the painting the fence you know what i mean like that i just and now those i'm starting to see the zeros and ones you know the pitches are coming in slower so then you you get to make those adjustments and so it's cool like i did 18 years of coaching baseball and I, i can pull all of that in and yeah, be like, right. oh, I, you know, I really flung my shoulder up, and I, re- I really forgot my setup and my and my premise. So when I got to the punchline, it wasn't as surprising for anybody. Like you, the same way I would analyze film, I can analyze some of those sets and 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 analyze my pitcher and where the pitch was. You know, so to me, that's fascinating. Like I'm all that part of it is just as exciting as because if you do all of that prep work off the stage, then you can just get in the box and have fun you know what i mean you can yeah, just because right. you know you've done all the work and you've put yourself in the best situation possible and now it's just time to have fun and then create that kind of like muscle memory like like yes. it, that would apply in the box and you know you, you don't even think about it. you know when it's in the, in the zone or not and yeah. um and when to swing and all that kind of stuff but it's like anything when you're teaching kids in little league i was coaching my daughter's like t-ball team uh you know which is you know horrendous to watch when you've coached varsity baseball for you know like so many years but like you know you can you can't teach them everything like it's like anything you gotta you know you gotta slow roll a lot of that stuff like training wheel style so like you know even though i'm watching my daughter like do silly stuff with t-ball like right now the focus is her making contact with the ball we'll worry about the power generating from her feet to her upward and the whole hip and shoulder separation i can't be bagging her down at six grades as a six-year-old right, right. with that so that that's some of the things as young com- as a young comic i've had to sort of i'm not young but i am young in terms of comic here right, so i've had to, i've had to really like you know suck up information from people like mark so being the presence of someone like mark who's been in the business for 30 years or frank vignola and some of these other guys that i've had the pleasure of working for who are entertainment professionals like that's been their career uh, you know, you start to just suck up that information and you just kind of say, all right, let me kneel in the matrix myself in this chair and, <laughs> and try not to jump the shark too. Like there's certain things that you just have to learn the hard way. There's certain things you can't get ahead of um, and your expectations. I can't have the same expectations. So I have to, but I think helping kids reach those goals in the classroom and on the field have helped me kind of put some of that in perspective too, you right know? On. Where would you say you are in terms, let's like in terms of baseball, little league, 
where are you in comedy? Are you? Well, that's a good question. I yeah. when people have asked me that recently, and it depend. You know, it always depends on your confidence in that moment. Um, but uh, now uh, I've, I'm getting some really good opportunities, so I'm definitely, I'm definitely in the farm system uh, of it, uh, where I'm getting some looks. I just have to stay consistent and and do what I do. But I don't want to, you know, you don't want to put yourself out before you're ready too. you know what I mean? So, uh, like I haven't hit New York on like, like my, my dream would be to eventually get where I'm hitting like the New York clubs on a regular basis. Um, but, uh, I've been hesitant to, 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 to go full out one cause I have family and I have some other things, but also I don't want to, I don't want to jump the gun. So right now it's all about building content, writing, 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 and then getting out there and getting a stage anywhere and everywhere you can, including a library at 2 PM on a right. Sunday. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. um, even I crashed like a poetry mic on Sunday night. Cause they give like 15 minutes and it's right in my local town. And I knew there, there, there are kids there. There was like a 13 and 14 year old kid in the audience. So it's great. Cause I try to work clean. Um, and it lets me know, like, can I make someone like that laugh and make an 80 year old in the library laugh? And, you know, the, the my demographics are probably like the 25 to 45 of of who like follows me on social media and stuff like that but it's cool because it makes you stretch those muscles and you know you can practice stuff like being in the room and working on that flow and using the stuff in the room to get you to your content and create that improv so that it seems like it's spontaneous or it seems like you know because parts of it are but you better have a path you better have a, a branch that you know if you're swinging you better have a branch you're going to find in a minute right, otherwise right, right. What, what what are we doing <laughs> that's um, another ad advantage you have too to teaching is that you are in tuned with what's happening now like like you know guys like in my age you know if i didn't have kids or, or uh you know or, or in your case like teaching you could lose touch with what's popular now pop culture yeah. who's like the famous who's the up the new singer like now i yeah. watch the grammys i don't know any of these people but like you probably do because yeah. you're in that world because of yeah. those because of teaching yeah, that's been one of my uh, one of my uh, recent bits that I've been doing up front with stuff is uh, slang terms that I'm hearing the kids use. And then, you know, sort of walking through how I walked in, how I learned, like, as I equally because I've had the advantage of being with kids, but how I still kind of walked into a wall, looked a little silly, um, because I think we all feel that way when we hear kids talk this way. And then you either go one of two things, you either try to learn it and use it to be cool like them, which is always a bad idea, uh, or... <laughs> Or you get angry and you're you turn into the guy who walked uphill both ways to school and right. you don't even it's the demise of civilization as you know it is happening in front of you. Um right, right. and so I try to walk that line, but also like so I have a lot of fun with with those things. So now I'm doing stuff like uh, have you heard phrases like cap and no cap? Have you heard oh. kids? So no, like that the... it's basically true or false, like you're lying or telling the truth. So if you're capping. You're lying. And if you like, we're like, hey, Mr. Yoder, I, I swear I did the homework. I just can't find it. No cap. Like, you know, like I'm not lying. I swear. It's like saying I swear to God. You right, know? Right. <laughs> but they're using cap and no cap. And so then it makes me think as a language guy, like, well, then I'm, I want to know where it comes from. You right, know what I mean? Yeah. What's the origins of so, that? And so, you know, it's funny when you do a dive for things like that, because we're not talking like, you know, this is not, this isn't the Royal Academy of English has not ruled down upon cap and no cap. Uh, the world of Wikipedia has. And so that's sort of the the thing where I go around and make it crowd work and see if anybody knows, because generally there's three that I've come across. And so each time I tell the joke, I'm hoping to get maybe another. So I have a, a line where I'm like, is anybody else want to edit this Wikipedia page while we're on it? You know, because it's like, because I've heard cap gun or real gun. So the cap comes from whether it's a cap gun or a real gun. Uh, okay. I've heard uh, hat as a cap. So you're being deceptive. You're hiding something under your cap. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then I've also heard that rappers used to have like these gold plated cap teeth that they would fit over that were temporary or fake. So they were capping. They were lying. Those were false. Um, and <laughs> so those are generally the three that you'll hear people say. I had somebody once said 
capital letters or something. I don't know. I, 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 I couldn't, <laughs> as I, as I listened back to the audio to see if he had given me something, cause I was like, Oh, maybe this is a new one I can add in. And it didn't hold water, but right, right. I think he was just, everybody's just grasping at straws. Cause nobody's, nobody's done the research. Don. Yeah, 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 you're doing the research. <laughs> I, I, I would, I'm doing the real work here. <laughs> I'm leaning towards the gun thing. I think that's the cap I, gun. I mean, I, you yeah. know, I think that always, I was thinking about that the other day. I was like, I haven't seen a cap gun in forever. And then, uh, we were out of town for the holidays and we we're going to do bath time and we didn't have our bath toys. So I'm like, all right, let's go to the dollar store. And lo and behold, there was your cap gun, but it didn't. Now they can't even have it with just the tip. Like the whole thing is obnoxiously orange, obviously. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, days, man. Um, but I was surprised to even see one. Cause it's just not, I even had uh, in sixth grade, a buddy of mine had a pen that had the same mechanisms. Like, you know, those cap guns had that red ring with the like little gunpowder things. And well, this you had to take one of those little pieces. And when you took the pen cap off, it was like a clip, kind of like how a mass mousetrap works. And you had to like put it on, put the cap on top, and then you slid the cap over. And then when you handed it to somebody, boom, popped right in their face. Yeah, it was uh, brilliant. It was great. We nice. used to go to the basketball games in middle school and try to get the younger kids like, oh, I want your autograph. And the kid would open it and like freak out and go cry. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so those are the things I did as a student. So now I bring a lot of that with me. That's why I'm so interested because like I would have been doing this as a kid. So there's another one, Bet. Have you heard Bet? I heard bet. Bet means I agree, right? Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah cool. Right. Right. Like, so yeah, it's this affirmation of of whatever information was just given to you, and so I'm doing a thing now where I like mistake it and I start pulling on my wallet trying to get this kid to do a line for it. <laughs> what are we doing? Are we, <laughs> what are we talking about, <laughs> yeah, buddy? Yeah. It's like he's like, no, Mister Yoder. It just means it just means okay. I'm like, well, then just say that. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> There's so many other things you can be doing with your time except reinventing this wheel. <laughs> um, you know, cause it's like, they're just, all they're doing is trying to confuse us, but every, every, every generation, I mean, we have different languages. Why do we have different languages? I mean, it's a part of identity. It's part of right, culture. Yeah, yeah. So like, sometimes it's them putting a stamp on their generation on, on what they think is cool. Um, because when they hear their grandparents talk, they don't want to talk like them. They don't want to talk. They want to have their own. They want to make it. So it's kind of cool to, to see how we kind of put words together and, yeah. you know, there's uh you know not to get too nerdy but there's a uh, two thir- schools of thought on language there's prescriptive and, and descriptive and uh, prescriptive are the rules that we should abide by like don't end a sentence with a preposition and say well not good when they ask you how you are but then it's really descriptive is how we actually use the language we say good we don't say well if somebody says how are you, you say good I mean I had a I had a teacher in high school I switched I went to a lot of schools but the last school I settled on um this guy would always like he would say how you doing son and i'd be like good he's like you're not good son you're well and like i can hear that voice in my head because every time he see me he would do it and it was because he was trying to prescriptively beat into me what that proper usage was and so now i can never answer that question without thinking about mr granger i will never (laughs) be able to answer you know how many times i get asked how are you in a day walking around a school building yeah Uh, like you know and i have so it's so it's sort of interesting because rules don't matter Yeah, Yeah, rules don't matter. You get what I meant, though. You know what I mean? Like, so now it's like you got to kind of give and take with those kind of things. So, yeah, I've I've been having fun with that. But you're right. Like keeping keeping a pulse on on what they're saying and why they're doing it. uh, I find fascinating. I just I mean, you know, it's just cool. Yeah, it gives you an edge too to when you want to play to different, like you said, different generations or different audiences. You can now coming up in, in, in Philly. Was that where you started comedy? Was that where you? Like, yeah, suburbs had- like the suburbs. So it was. I was sort of a pandemic guy. Uh, I had um, was my wife and I are both teachers. You know, lockdown was crazy, and so what we kind of noticed is uh, on our TV in the family room because our house is kind of an open floor plan. So we're all you know, which is kind of nice. I like that we're all in each other's. Bu- you know, it's good and bad. You're all in each other's business, but uh, right, yeah. so the the family TV sort of is like this kind of central point in the background for a lot of it. And we just noticed Impractical Jokers was on all the time. Like my right. wife and I, we've gone and see them live. We we were big in going to comedy clubs as dates and stuff like that when yeah, we were yeah. dating. And so it was something that we listened to Pandora, like, you know, either, you know, Louis C.K. or Chris Rock. Like we pick a different person each night and let it loop through. So we've always been 
in the comedy. I just noticed we were laughing, laughing less just personally because everything was so so much more stressed. You're teaching your own kids. You're teaching all the other kids on Zoom. You're trying to figure out if the world's ending. You know, like you, have a, times, we, you know, yeah. we had a three year old and a six year old and my six year old's autistic and she needs patterns and and she needs habits and rituals. And, and that was really hard to do yeah, uh, yeah so there was just a lot of added stress um so it's like we weren't laughing as much and so there was a club nearby me called soul joels which a lot of people know because it kind of kept things alive during the pandemic and it yeah. literally i could walk there from my house right now like where oh, wow. it was located was like yeah. in my backyard that was our last date my wife and i had gone to his inside club in like valentine's day of 2019 uh we went to an inside show there and then you know, during the pandemic, he had put up this like airplane hangar, like giant tent yeah. and had like the propane tanks. Cause this was like winter, like it like October, November, we started, he started doing open mic nights on Tuesdays and we would just go cause it was free. And we were like, Oh, my mom lives with us. We got somebody in our bubble. Uh, we can do a date night. Let's just get out of the house. And cause we were taking, we were taking tri- like turns doing 15 minute rides in the car around the neighborhood just to give each other like a break out of the house. Like yeah, that, yeah, was, yeah. that, that was, that was, <laughs> So then we're like, okay, now when stuff like that happened, we, you know, you would go sit in, you know, in your little clump by your little heater and, and then they had it up there. And so I watched and I was like, I think I could do this. Spent all of my winter break, not answering emails, not working, just setting boundaries. And I just started writing and I was like, uh, and then I would just go up every week with something new. And it just became a thing that I couldn't wait. Then I couldn't wait till the next Tuesday. I couldn't wait till the next Tuesday. And That's then you cool. just start finding other mics. And I set a goal. I was like, do, if you're going to do it once, do it a hundred times. And so I set a goal of a hundred mics for my first year. And I think I obliter- I started to find another mics. And so like seven months in, I had already hit the goal. And so I almost doubled the goal. And then all of a sudden started getting opportunities like, hey, come on this bar show or come host this thing or come host this mic. And so this is all through 2020. Yeah. And that's and so then all over there, things started opening up just as I was. I took a I read a couple books, uh, started doing some of the exercises they had in there and then just kind of let that take me. Uh, and I just really liked writing. I didn't realize how much I liked writing, uh, just, you know, how fun the wordplay and how to, you know, and then getting up there and trying to make the 21 year old kids laugh that were, you know, sometimes it's just other comics. So like, that's a whole different dynamic when you're at some of these open mics, yeah, yeah. like stuff that I would put in my act that is great. Won't get a laugh at, at a, at a, at a dive bar, you know, at midnight when they've heard 36 <laughs> other comics in front of you. But now that's, now that's a lot of that's different. Now I know like, okay, that's not, that's, I'm not looking for that. I'm either working on my pacing tonight or I'm, you know, you start to kind of, understand how all of that works um and it's just fun it's just i get up there and it's just like a switch flips and it's just like well, this is on let's do this um but yeah so then the next thing you know i've i've been on you know th- i've been in like four or five of the clubs in new york i've only had to i've only maybe done one or two bringer shows up there but i've then started getting some opportunities to get on off nights and um uh i worked a little bit with the american comedy institute and Steven Rosenfield, and he sort of had given me some tips early on. And he had, you know, I had people make comments to me that was like, this is, this can go as far as you want it to go. And then all of a sudden it stopped being like Sunday league, you know, softball. And it became, all right, right, let's, let's, let's really buckle down and do what, what you can do within the constraints of being a family guy, you know, being a full-time teacher and, you know can you also do this is it possible and it turns out it is so that's <laughs> a very yeah for that. that's gotta be that's gotta be tough to to juggle um all of those things when you have um you know when you're teacher a father and a comedian and, mm-hmm. and you know so to, to juggle the family life the work life and then the comedy life how, how what's the secret to doing that and, and making that um work uh, I think this the the big thing is I'm me and, and all of those facets. So I'm not I'm not like I'm always me when I'm on stage, when I'm with my kids, when I'm at work, like I'm the same guy, um, you know, um, 
And I think that helps because everything just seems to flow. Like I, when I used to, before this, when I was just, you know, teaching and wasn't even thinking about comedy, I was a coach or I was always doing something. I was like, you know, I coached three sports. I would announce the games. I read the names of graduation. Like, so I was always like, my mom always had me and stuff early on, like, you know, karate to, you know, ballet to gymnastics, to theater, to tap. Like, so I think, you know, the way I was raised, you know, my parents always kind of put me into activities to keep me moving. Plus, I mean, they were working double two jobs and my mom had gone back and become a nurse later in life. So I was around ambitious people who were always doing things. So part of it is just that's how it is. But now this flows so easily. Like we use Google Calendar for everybody's got a color and a color code. And whenever I get an opportunity or a show or a mic, I put it in the calendar and then I immediately see if it fits or nope, Katie's got gymnastics. I'm the one who takes her to gymnastics or I take my daughter to piano on Wednesdays. Um, and I, that middle part of the day as a comedian is beautiful. I get out, I'm done teaching by like 2.30 every day. Yeah, that's a good And idea. so like that 2.30 to 6 o'clock is nothing's going on. Like nothing's going on there. So I get to be dad. Like I get them off the bus as a co as a <laughs> baseball coach and all the. I never got home before dinner. Right, I mean, sometimes right. when ba baseball is all year, like we have pitchers and catchers reporting in January to start throwing. We have am catcher workouts we had like and we weren't getting paid like so you talk about right, right. like people are, you know people are all like oh you're running around you're doing all these things i'm like yeah but nobody said anything for 17 years right, when, I was, when I was coaching other people's kids for free right yeah you know and then i wasn't even home to get my own daughters off the bus because i was doing this thing that seemingly i loved and i did right um but uh, i just didn't know i just didn't know how much more i loved this because i had never done it um so yeah, so it's and so it's really interesting cuz internally I'm I've never been more relaxed and I never double book myself with coaching and all that. I used to constantly be running and when you're coaching and stuff, you're sweaty, you got to change clothes like I don't have to worry about that. Like usually whatever <laughs> I wear, I'm just bringing another shirt to throw on over before I hop on stage and so there's not as much of a rigmarole it's 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 it tells me that i'm on the right track what, what i'm doing is what i'm supposed to be doing so in all of those we I'm, I'm the one who takes my daughters to the appointments i have telehealth with my daughter's pediatrician on the phone today everything just yeah my wife and i my wife and i we have our roles we know what our roles are we we were together for you know these two years hunkered down so those were pivotal years i got to be with my two-year-old until she was four-year-old uninterrupted for two years straight yeah you know what I mean? like so I, I i i've set such great things because that's a lot of my act is being a dad because you know that's something that i'm sure we'll be talking about next is that for me was something i didn't my dad wasn't around growing up so like i was always very hesitant like when i found out to be a dad i was like all right i got to do this right and i don't i don't have a stencil to look at it and have a model you know, I have a joke where I talk about how oh, my TV was stuck on, you know, channel six. So all we watched was the Cosby show. And even my fictional dad was a disappointment, you know, like, <laughs> so like just this, this concept of like, I didn't know if I was doing it right. So a lot of my act is like, guys, I have no idea if I'm doing this right. Here's what happened. This is what I did. What do you think? Right, um, right. Because I'm really playing on that truth, that truism of mine, which is like, I'm kind of looking at my family tree and being like, my family tree wasn't like a lot of other people's family tree. I, you know, and you and I know a little bit about this, but you know, I was raised by two women essentially in the eighties and nineties, Scranton, Pennsylvania, which, you know, is a little bit like living in witness protection. You know, you just tell everybody <laughs> you're living with the golden girls and you hope that they don't ask questions. Um, and, yeah. and, uh, and, and that was a big part of my identity growing up was I didn't know. I felt like I was always lying to people. Like I felt like I was always lying about my mom and her friend or my, there's no other word. There was no modern family. You know what I mean? Like, right. Right. Yeah. There was, it was nothing like that in the eighties and nineties, just so people know. So you had two moms essentially. Mm -hmm. And when, at what time in your life did you realize that you would it wasn't a nuclear family that you was yeah in, right like, I, yeah, when, I was thinking about that the other day because i started writing sort of like all of my like my almost like a life story just to kind of like flush all of that out because like my parents like my biological parents were a man and a woman who shacked up after college and tried to play house and and both really wanted to have a family and do the, the american dream and two and a half dogs and all that stuff and they both just in their hearts that wasn't that wasn't what they wanted. And I think they were both seeking, you know, their family's approval and what they knew they were supposed to want out of life. And then they both said, you know what, this isn't working for me. And my mom did that earlier. She, she parachuted out 
pretty early by the time I was two and they had divorced. And uh, so I don't have any memories of my biological parents together. But uh, my mom had met a woman uh, who was a nurse from Australia who had uh, been landed in Scranton, Pennsylvania as a, psych a psychiatric nurse in the hospital there. And they met at a uh, conference. And that was my parent. That was, those were my parents when I refer to my parents. Because I always use the word parents, because then I'm like, when I say mom, I feel like I have to say moms. And if I have to say moms, then I have to have a dissertation and like <laughs> lay out, you know what I mean? Like, those are the right. little moments yeah, yeah, yeah. that it's like, and so that's what life was like for me as a, as a kid trying to figure out who, how much do I tell you? What do I tell you? But is it going to stop the real conversation we're trying to have? Like, um, and so, uh, and then my dad, you know, at that point kind of moved out of life. So he had to figure, he tried to get remarried, he remarried another woman, did the whole Chick-fil-A drive through service, like just tried to, you know, fold an eye defense. Um, and so he kind of was out for a while there. Right. Um, and then fortunately now we have a, a good relationship. My dad, he's married in Spain, uh, married to the same guy for 20 years. Um, and they're both great grandparents to my, to my granddaughters now. So, uh, that's great. And so some funny between that is like, I make sure that they each have a word for my daughters have a word for both of them. Cause that was something that always bothered me is I had no word for Colleen, who was my mom's, uh, my mom's wife or partner. You weren't allowed to have a wife back then, but it was, that was who she had spent life with. And so, uh, I didn't have a word for her and it was just, it kind of made me think of that's what like Kamala Harris's husband must have felt like when he walked in there, like, oh, what do we call this guy? Like, you know, what do you call her? Did you ever come up with what? So, what I mean, I mean, you know, it's it just like it's so certain times when I say mom, I just might not be referring. To, I might be referring to one versus the other. So uh, the reality was, no, I just called her Colleen or I said she was my aunt or, or she was my mom's friend, depending on how, how did you know. when they were raising you. Because I find this fascinating, especially in, in today's world, you know, where a lot of this is now way more acceptable. You yeah. know what I'm saying? This is it's almost crazy. mainstream now. Yeah. Do you know how pissed I am about that? No, I'm not really. <laughs> but like, just like, well, like, you know, everybody, you know, you have to go through that. So I hope, thankfully, there must have been enough kids out there like me or whatever that we finally got to a place where we see that. And that's what I want my comedy to be about, too, is is sort of the normalizing what should have been normalized when I was growing up. Right. And not this. So it's it's crazy because when I started teaching, I started noticing that they had a you know what a club that they called the Gay Straight Alliance. I actually heard about it in college, uh, and that's when I was like, oh my goodness, there's like there's a club for this. Like I just spent people my whole like life, you like, that were raised with gay parents, or or, or at least for 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 uh, an avenue to talk about how you know that it was a thing, and that um, you know you could you could be allies and even if you weren't like there was just being talked about just the fact that it, and right. that was part of what the club was to just you know to not make it the stigma to not make it this thing and to to educate and to and to give a place where you know those kids who felt that way now for me i was i wasn't gay that's part of me like oh i was the only one who turned out not gay my dad's gay my mom's gay my mom's brother's gay i'm the only one like somehow so that, you know, that it must have skipped a generation i don't know um <laughs> But like, you know, and, and so then you're like, oh, nature versus nurture. Well, hey, I don't know what to tell you on this one. Um, <laughs> Did you have to come out of the closet? Yeah, right. Well, that's, what I was, that's, what, that's what I'm actually currently working on where I had to come out straight, you know, and I <laughs> broke it to my mom's in a Home Depot. And so then they they helped me build a closet for me and my friend who happens to be a girl. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, so it's just like, how do I play with that? How do I take those those things that for me were were traumatic? I mean, it was like, like I, I don't know, so it's like you know, scared at any point, but like you just you had a lot to. I didn't want people to judge me because of that. My mom didn't want that. That was her biggest fear was that people were going to treat me differently because of her decisions, and that That's was what, the yeah. thing. That's that what I wanted to thing. ask you. Yeah, because I wanted to see when you were growing up in, in the 80s and 90s, when it wasn't as accepted as it is today, were, you you know, your parents not, you know, like what advice did they give you when you would go to school, when you bring friends over or, or any of that kind of stuff? Did they like how was that vibe? And was it a secret or like how? Did yeah, you know it was it? just it was sort of it was sort of like this you know, it's just not something we're going to talk about. Or if we do, then they're friends, which isn't a lie. They were friends. Uh, they didn't need to know their intimacy levels. I didn't know that about my friend's parents. Why did they have to know that? Uh, but, you know, but there's this constant need from and when you meet someone in the LGBT 
LGBTQ community uh, or IA plus, you, you have to sort of now all of a sudden, because we don't know a lot about it, there become all of these probing questions people want to know that you would never ask a straight person, but because right. it's new. So it's like, you, I can understand that from just, a hum, you know, being curious by nature. So, but so just, I didn't want to have to, like I said, every time I got into a conversation with someone in the store, I was there to talk to them about the game or whatever. I didn't want it to get sidetracked. So then you just learn to say, okay, that's not the point of this conversation. So what do I just give them so that their brain can comprehend that part? Because I had two adults who loved me, cared me, make sure I got to practice on time, fed me and did my laundry. Uh, yeah, that, that's so in that instance, you just talk about, you know, my mom and her sister who happened to have an Australian accent and they look nothing alike. Um <laughs> But the the story, we sort of had a backstory, or at least I had created one at some point. I don't know that we sat down in a situation room and had like a family meeting, but, but like the, the things I would say was uh, that's, you know, my mom's aunt, but through marriage and that my uncle, my mom's brother had died because her husband had passed. She was married originally. My, my other mother was also married originally. She actually had five kids. She was married to a military spouse. They had moved all over the world. And because she was like maybe 10 to 12 years older than my mom, her kids were like adults and grown by the time uh, they had started their relationship. So I actually had this other kind of like siblings, almost like step siblings in yeah. a way. And that was a whole different dynamic. Some of them had accepted me and I had one that I kind of looked up to like a brother who lived with us for a period of time because he was in the military. So when he wasn't out, he would stay in the guest room. But even the dynamics of the house, like when I had friends sleep over, like when I got to the age that kids started sleeping over, they would actually sleep and they would use the guest room as one of their bedrooms. So they would pretend that they had two bedrooms that they weren't staying wow. in one bedroom. So like my mom would legit do that. She wouldn't even just say that. Like she would do that. Like she kept up those appearances, which, you know, in retrospect, think about now is wow. That's like, you know, it's like, whatever, she's sleeping in that bed tonight, whatever. But there, you know, it's just, you had to do that, you know, like, yeah. It like, actually gives me the goosebumps. Like, um, because she did that, you know, for you, I guess, and and it was the time that it was, and makes you yeah. realize how fortunate we are now that that we've gotten through it because of of people like your mom and and um, who you know kind of paved the way for where we are today with this. It's it's yeah, it's incredible what you got, but you know, like you said, you do what you got to do because that's not the point. We just want to have a normal life, so she got you know, put me in a bunch of activities, and they had great circle of friend groups that you know there were <laughs> there was this like a uh, group of gay guys probably about three different couples, six different guys in the next town over. And it was just typical. Like one was the town Flores, one owned the dinner theater, you know, uh, and great guys lavish. I was like, you know, it was like watching Nathan Lane and Robin Williams and the birdcage, like the house looked like that. And, you know, and so we spent a lot of time there for like, you know, uh, holidays and stuff like that. Uh, and so that was sort of our family when like, you know, some of my, their families weren't accepting of their lifestyle um, or were to a degree, but not in there. So when we wanted to be comfortable and not feel awkward, then we all kind of, you know, had this other family that was not blood family. So that's another thing that's kind of cool for me is I have a lot of family that have people I consider family. So that didn't have to be blood. So that taught me that, you know, you know, blood's great. I understand that, but it's not, that's not what defines the people you have in your life and the relationships you have with them. So, um, you know, family and tradition is great, but you can have family and tradition and not have blood. Like those things don't, you know, in the same right. way you can have a relationship and a marriage and not have it be a guy and a girl. Right, um, right. So it's, uh, I can understand that now, like things like that make sense to me, but man, did I wish it was easier growing up? Do I wish I, I could have just said, you know, <laughs> you know, would it have been nice, but I'll tell you what, it would have been a lot blander uh, of a life than the, than the one I got to live. And I, I can't duplicate what I went through and those experiences. And then a lot of it was fun stuff. Most of it was funny. I had great memories because my mom worked so hard to, to make sure that um, things were as normal. But I think for her, she tried to live like, even though she had this lifestyle and she was embracing it to a degree, she was still trying to put the stencil of that Norman Rockwell painting on. Like she held on to weird traditions and things like that, that she knew my mom would have wanted. And she always, or her, her, my grandma would have right, wanted. Right. So, you know, you could see the, the burden that, uh, you know, that, that probably took on her to kind of, you know, try to find a way. So it's, it's, she was a pioneer in some senses like that. So kudos to her and Colleen for how, like that they decided that they found happiness and they wanted that and they tried to pursue that as 
as best as the same to my dad. It took my dad a little bit longer. I always joked that when AOL came out, so did he. Like that was sort of the <laughs> the rocket point of when he you know started exploring, and it was all, all of a sudden probably had an avenue. You can't just go down the street to the bar. And I think when those things came about, it gave a way for people to express themselves in a variety of ways. Um, and he's got a healthy and happy relationship. And like I said, him, him and Luis are great uh, grandparents. We went and spent about a month with them in Spain in the summer. Oh, took nice, both, yeah. My wife took both girls. We've even had them stay over in the same house with my mom. My So my my uh, my other, my non-biological mother, Colleen, she's passed away since. Oh, but God my, bless. My, but my mom lived, my, my biological mom, uh, Marion, lives with us. So there was a time there where... Luis and Mark, my my dad and and his husband came and stayed with us for like six weeks. I thought it was a weekend. I thought I had committed to a weekend. And they're like, it was like when uh, coming to America and they're bringing the trunks, like they're like carrying stuff in. And I'm like, what is happening? And I didn't know because they hadn't been in the same the house together. Like, and they were always cordial and they didn't have like a bet. But like, it was funny because it took a little like back and forth of like ne- negotiating like all the household and stuff like that. But yeah. in the end, it was beautiful because like Luis is a crazy good cleaner. Like he like tears the house apart, like on a daily basis and cleans. My dad's a great cook. Like my mom had the pattern with the girls and all of that. So like when they were like, and things were getting fixed, I wanted a cat door. Like Luis has like, then Luis stopped cleaning and he's now got like a, a horse and a saw wow. and he's sawing the door and he's like so handy. And then he's out <laughs> in the garden planting irises. Like, like wow. what is happening? Like, and so it just became once it just became this beautiful moment. And I'm like 36 years old at this point. And now my family all figured out who they were. We don't have to be apologetic anymore. And now here we are all in this household together. And I had the weirdest moment because one night I was sitting in the living room and I looked over to my right and I looked to my left and I'm like, oh my God, I am in a living room and like prime time on like a weekday. And there's my mom and there's my dad for the first time in my life. And what's on the, and what's on the TV this is us on NBC. And I'm like, this is like so poetic right now. Like That's great. Um, but like, so it's sort of interesting how, how all of that has, has come together. Like, uh, and I'm so proud of them for, for not fighting and pushing down and, and going against that grain, because I, I know a lot of people must do that. There must be tons of people that, you know, hide in that closet. There's the reason we call it hiding, you know, staying in the closet. And then yeah, yeah. I think it's so easy. I think there's still people today that feel like they have to do that regardless. And, you know, I'm, I'm proud of them for, for going against that and, and staying true to themselves. Cause that's, that's what now I get to go on stage and I get to be myself and I get to, t- and so that to me is really important because I felt like I've lied most of my life to myself and everybody around me about the simplest of things. I don't want to lie anymore. So now it's like, all right, let's, 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 let's put that truth out there. Let's, let's do that. And let's, so let's build that tension and then find ways to break it because it is, it's ridiculous that, that it had to be like that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, and, but the, the story is, is powerful. And uh, um, I know you, you, you want, you're a writer. You, I don't know if you plan on writing this out into a, a you know, a, a book or something, or if you're using it for your material in, in your standup, but it's definitely um, a, kind of a powerful story, especially for these times of um, they have, you know, both, both uh, parents um, are homosexuals with their yeah. spouses and, and, but it all works and they did a great job raising you. Yeah. And, and uh, you're a testament to, to that to anyone who yep. doubts that it could work or whatever that, you know, the, the haters out there or whatever yeah. you're a testament to that it, it it's a positive thing and, and it and it works and, and it's a good thing and it's normal it's it, yeah it, you know and um but i was wondering if if you do um work it into your act and, yeah so and- there's certain parts i have currently like i always started with my mom first um and uh and a lot of uh just the revealing that you know, usually I'm like, oh, I'm trying to raise my kids like I was raised, but it's really hard. You know, I'll, you know, go in the crowd. I'm like, you raise them how you were raised. And and then I'll go and I start talking about being raised by lesbians. And then usually you get to see what kind of audience you have at that moment. Because <laughs> right. then 
hush falls over the crowd. And then you got to poke at that. You got to, you got to break the ice with that. So I, you know, I start doing a little wordplay jokes about like, yeah, yeah, you guys, I mean, you guys can imagine eighties and it's land before time guys, Ellen was still straight, <laughs> you know? And then usually that's the first, you know, chip of the ice starts breaking away there. And then I have a few like Flintstones, you know, Flintstones and modern family and only the Flintstones were because Flintstones and the theme song was you'll have a gay old time. I'm like, only the Flintstones were allowed to have a gay old time back then. Uh, and, and it wasn't exactly a modern family because then then boom, you get to pull in that reference. And so, you know, by then now I've hit them with a couple pop culture references. And then I have the fun one I've been playing with about how like I'm like, you can imagine as a kid, guys, the streets of Scranton in the 80s. With gay moms, I mean, it was riddled with cracks. If I stepped on one, I could kill both. My, I'd be an orphan, instant orphan status. It was the stakes were higher, is what I'm saying, guys. <laughs> um, you know, because then you're, you know, then you're playing on the some of those simple things, or like, oh, you know, oh, you guys probably had a father, and you got to, you got a month in between, you know, saving your allowance before Father's Day, and. <laughs> like, I wish I just figured out which one was the butch one and bought her a tie tack in June, you know, or like. <laughs> You know, and you start trying to find ways to to bring it up, but then like, you know, break that tension. Um, and, I, you know, I, I think one of the first for me, and this is a controversial one, but the Hannah Gadsby is usually uh, like for me that that when I saw Nanette and then Douglas, for me, that was huge on two levels. One, because she was attacking that Nanette thing. I that resonated for me on a deeper level. Um and then I showed my mom and I'd never seen my mom and I watched it on like a long car ride to like taking her up to some family in New York. And she, I could see her, she was honed in on it. And I thought for her, it must've been pretty cathartic to kind of, yeah. you know, get that space. Um, so I really enjoyed the building of tension and then the releasing of tension. And I could see, and then the part, the thing about Nanette that usually was the one is that she built tension, then refused to release it. Yeah. And that's what yeah. got people. But she's like, you know what? You should have to feel that tension because guess what? And I, and that resonated with me because it's like, yeah, you know what? I had to do all of these, all these silly little lies that I had to tell. And I had to constantly have that tension. Are they going to find out? Then they're going to find out I'm a liar. Then they're going to find, you know, so now they're thinking I'm dishonest now. And even right, though my right. intentions were good, I was, you know, lying is essentially something you're not supposed to do, even if it's for, so, you know, like that, I could appreciate her not releasing that tension. And it kind of felt like that was not for those people. That was for the rest of us that have had to hold on to tension so that other people didn't have it. And that was the point of that. And I, that for me, that made sense to me. And that's who she was speaking to in that moment. So if right. you were someone of the patriarchy who she's needling, as she says the whole time, then yeah, you're going to be pissed because you've been poked with a stick the whole time. You wouldn't expect me to laugh because you've been poking me with a stick. So it's like, but that was her saying like, well, we felt like we were being forced into lying and that's tension that we didn't want to have to carry just so you wouldn't feel or whoever wouldn't feel. So I, I, I that for me was a huge uh thing where i'm like wow i i need to i keep i need to tell this because i have a different perspective than her and then she started talking about autism too which is close to my heart because my firstborn right. my oldest daughter who's <laughs> an angel um has autism and i'm fascinated by it and right, people right. watch her all the time and because i was <laughs> waiting for her to speak she didn't talk till she was almost five and like you know and then so then when she did start speaking it was kind of like a foreign exchange student like so you had to really understand what she was trying to to say and so like so those were two big themes and 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 and, and douglas and then you know i don't know if you saw did you see either of them i i've seen one of them i forget which one but so, i just remember watching it and and it was one of the few comedy specials that i ever saw that uh, i actually was like got choked up at the end like i was crying yeah, so like, and Annette did that. Whereas Douglas, she went for uh, Douglas. She does this really cool technique of like a call forward. So like, she basically spent the first fourteen minutes of the special outlining the special, so that then everything was a callback after that. And it was right, like, right. oh my god, that was like so. From a comedy <laughs> standpoint, that was brilliant. So regardless of how people were bent out of shape about Nanette, I was like, wow, what a brilliant thing to do to say. Oh, I am a comedian here. As a matter of fact, I'm going to prove it. And every joke I'm telling is now a callback. And like, to me, that was fascinating. So then 
I respect her on many levels for that because there is, you know, the structure and the jokes and all of this, but she was also laying herself out there. And she's, I find I find that fascinating. And she's Australian too, right? Yeah. So I think she's from New Zealand technically. So, but okay. there was a connection there because yeah, yeah. she had done a big price. So that was another piece. I'm like, wow, this is filling all these gaps. Cause <laughs> uh Colleen, uh, my other mother, she she was actually before I knew her, she was an, a nurse to the Aborigines in the outback when she was like 17 and 18. That's wow. how she first got into nursing. She was helping deliver babies in, in the wild. So like, I mean, talk about stories, like the stories she would tell growing up. And she was yeah. so cool. She was like just the, the life of the party. So much fun. She loved life. She just wanted to enjoy life. She once she had I think once she had finally committed to herself that she was not going to live for that lie anymore. I didn't get to see that part of her. I only got to see the liberated version of her that wasn't, you know, living this lie like she had lived to raise those five kids. And so when she raised me, she got to raise me as herself. And I think that was really cool because I got to see a, a different side of her than than her five biological kids got to see of her. And uh, I was very grateful for that, you know, and like I can just just remember how, uh, you know, I fought it at first. Like you fight, you know, like you fight. I don't know if you have ever, if you have a divorced parents, but like whenever I see any of my friends who had to, to have like their parents start dating someone else yeah, and have yeah, a stepdad yeah. or a step parent, like I fought her tooth and nail on that. Like we had some, some battles like any kid would have, you know, if they yeah, were yeah, hetero yeah. of like, but like, and then I think about what I glean now that she's not no longer with us. All I, all I think about her are, are the laughing or, you know, you know, sitting on the bed watching primetime TV and Jello as a snack, and like yeah. <laughs> you know, watching the uh, Miss Universe and and both finding the girls attractive, and like you know, the way you would poke at the cheerleaders with right, that right. on Sunday. Right. I was, you know, I was doing with her, and then, um, you know, so you get some of those things which are kind of fun. So I've I've worked a lot of that into into my act, and then I started talking a little bit about my dad, um, but I didn't want to do too much without talking with him first, and so. Um, he's not a, I, so, you know, so sometimes I have a few stories that I've run by him that are good. So I always want to make sure that if I'm going to do that, I'm portraying something that they're proud of, you know, because they, yeah, yeah, they already went through it trying to do this. So anything I'm telling is going to try to, you know, just like with my daughter and autism, she's always going to be the hero of the story, um, you know, in that same vein. So I just try to stay true to, to that and not, not try to get a cheap laugh or get a, whatever I'm trying to. Right. trying to i'm trying to you know i've had someone come up to me after a show where she hadn't talked to her daughter in a while and her daughter came out to her and now she could see how her daughter could have the life she thought she was going to lose the minute she came out of the closet to her you know like those are the kind of things that or the the parents who have a kid with autism that they were you know just got the diagnosis and they were very nervous about what it could mean or what it was going to and so i've had a, a lot of those post-show conversations uh which just kept telling me to oh keep hammering this nail because we all need that you know we all need to know that we're not alone and and know? that's a, a great way to, to do it is, is the, a positive like you said make them the hero it's a positive um spin on everything but also the truth is is said in in jest so if you make and people will accept things if if they're if if it's said in certain ways and i think yeah. that that's the power of what you have what your life experience is yeah. um you know and I, th- and I think you're doing a great job and you, you're kind of you know kind of molding that now as far as like how you're going to craft that into your act and yeah. I, I think that could really uh be something powerful and and, and special the way you because the best thing any comedian can do always is pull from their life yeah and not everyone has a life as a kind of amazing and fascinating as <laughs> yeah. yours and, and yeah. uh, coming up the, the, and being raised the way you, you were puts a, a different spin on you have different experiences than, you know, and, and, and yeah. a different outlook on, on, on life and a different outlook on, on a lot of things because of the way you were raised. And I think that's an advantage. Um, and, and you could definitely help kind of spread that, that word. Yeah on the comedy stage you're going to all these different cities and stuff now and, and- yeah so I, I yeah i really want that's a big part of yeah that's a big part of trying to fit that in and do that which has been a lot of fun and it's funny too because my one of my uh one of my best friends i'm still friends with from childhood uh i had met him in eighth grade he had moved in and i was 
so excited because our school was so small that I was like the last one to move in at third grade. So from third to eighth, we didn't really have any other students. So he had moved in and he was kind of an outcast for a while. Turns out he had moved there because his public school was on strike. And I didn't realize at the time, but later on, I found out that his mom had died. And so he had to go move in with his dad. Uh, and so he and I became really good friends uh, and over time found out that his mom was actually a lesbian. And it was something that neither of us had ever said out loud. And it took maybe a year or so of us hanging out like, you know, a lot to where we started saying things where he could start seeing with my mom and, and he could, you know, he could read through the fine print that maybe some of the fronts and lies I was telling were passing uh, cause the other guys were just paying attention to whatever right, uh, right, right. that. So that was kind of an interesting thing. Cause that was the first person I ever met that also had a gay parent. And so that was a huge thing for me at that point in my life to know that I wasn't alone. So he and I to this day are still really good friends. I'm actually was, um, been down to stay with him in Durham and I've done a couple of shows down there and I'm supposed to be doing a, a, a show down there in May with uh, the board teachers uh, comedy tour. But he actually, when he found out about me doing my goal, um, he's such a, a sweet guy. So I had this goal of the hundred mics. He sent me this, uh, this statue with that, just a rattle <laughs> goat on it. And it was just like the, you know, king of comedy, hundred mics, like, you know, cause it was a goal whenever he and I have set goals. That's for awesome. Man. Like, you know, he wanted to get out of town. I wanted to get out of town. We both are successful and have not lived back in the area. He actually is a professor for NYU online oh, nice. um, and then as a published writer. And so like he and I always joke that we got like, we got out and not only did we get out, like most of our friends that got out, got out in the military and he and I were the two that didn't, you could tell didn't belong there. Weren't really from there. And like, so I think we had an ex a shared experience there where we knew we were different. And it, I think it allowed us to explore more than the average person. Cause you know, when you grow up in the town and you have your typical parents and you end up working at the bowling alley, sometimes right, you stay right. working at the bowling alley. And I don't think he or I were ever raised like that. And so I think we had a different vibe and it's been kind of cool because now I, when I run some of my material, I can pull from him because I can say, Hey, is this, is this, was this also your experience or so yeah. it, he and I actually in, uh, in college, he was always such a great writer. I never, I wrote the day before the paper was due and turned it in. <laughs> yeah. and I was a good enough bullshitter that it worked. Uh, he would like write it two weeks in advance, print it out, type, have a pencil and be like circling and going through it. And so he taught me how to do some of that in high school towards the end. And uh, and then in college, we got together and wrote a play called This Is Me. Uh, and it was a play uh, about like growing up like that. And it was like these acts of all these moments um, in life. And it was this cool experience that I forgot about for years. We'd done this. We spent it summer. I went down. He was at Virginia Tech then. I went down there for the summer. We did all this writing. And so and now I've started going back to that document and pulling stuff from that. Nice. Yeah. Um, you know, which is kind of fun because I think, you know, you had mentioned earlier you know, in a book or whatever. I'm like, I'd love like, I think uh, it'd be so much so fun to do a sitcom, a book. Um, a sitcom you know, I'm would open. be great, yeah. I think that would be fun because it's like, oh, like, you know, you got, you know, this guy, like a dad, a special needs dad, a teacher, like grew up with this crazy family, like there. But yet at the same time that everything's the same, it could be no different than why I enjoy you know, home improvement growing up or why we enjoyed full house. I mean, there was right, a non-traditional right. family full house. You got three dudes, you know, yep, yep. Jen, what's going on with Joey? <laughs> Let's talk about Joey for a minute. It was Joey Gladstone. Guy. Um, <laughs> so, um, but you know, like I think, you know, I look back at some of those iconic ones and it wasn't always traditional families. I always gravitated to the ones that were, there was a show. Do you remember this? My two dads. Yeah. Yeah. And do you remember yeah. the, do you remember the premise yeah, Ryan, of that show? Um, yeah, it was the they didn't know who the father was, right? So yeah, right. And then they were right. like, so yeah, and then they were both in this apartment together, and they're like, all right, we'll share. It. Like, what? Like that was somehow that was somehow more reasonable and rational to put on TV than my life, which was real and happening. <laughs> like, like that blows my mind. That like, um, you know, um, but I hate you know. It's so anytime I saw a non traditional, I always grab it, you know, because it was just. I, I, you know, you, and that's the, that's the moral of the story in my mind that like, it's like religions, you know, at the end of the day where we have the same pillars, you know, be kind to each other. You know, I went to, I went to Ursinus college, which is down outside of Philly. 
And there's a small like liberal arts school, but they had you take a course called CIE, the Common Intellectual Experience. And every freshman had to take it. Every professor had to teach it. Uh, and I got, it got clumped together in different groups. So my first semester, I had a biology teacher. My second semester, I had a philosophy teacher. And you're in there with kids of all walks of life, atheists, uh, furries to whatever. Right. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, it was interesting because every time you read literature, you started with like Beowulf and the Epic of Gilgamesh and you read the, you know, the Quran and the, the Torah and all of this. And then then you got into like Sigmund Freud and Marxism, like all these different survey of world literature and everything you read, you were supposed to think about three things. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be good? And what is our role in the universe? And uh, sitting in those conversations, that that course was probably the most important course I ever took in my life because it just it oh, it took the blinders off of everybody and it forced you to have conversations that were uncomfortable. But at the end of the day, it all boiled down to we were saying the same thing. We just had a couple different, you know. It's like you know, it's like fast food. Every restaurant has a chicken sandwich. You know what I mean? Right, like you right. Might, yeah. Um, and so that's what we need to focus on, not not how different we are, but some of those core similarities. And that's sort of, you know, my take on things. Awesome, man. Awesome. And no caps in that at all. Oh, I was not capping, dude. That was the first time <laughs> in my life I was not capping. Uh, I was like, be, bet, you know, <laughs> say less. That's the other one. Have you heard that? Say less. Yeah, yeah. I, and I swear, so this one, I, I joke about a kid, but I created a scene. Actually, a comic had, a young comic had hit me up. I was going to be in Nashville. And so somebody put me in touch with the guy that was a producer of shows, and he got me on a show. And I'm like, hey, just let me know. I got some people down here. I'm happy to advertise. And I'm going on and on. And, you know, I'm young. I'm energetic. I want to work in Nashville. I'm like, this is great. So I keep saying, and all he says back to me is, say less. I was like, say, say what? You know what? I'll say nothing. I ghosted the guy. I didn't talk to him for a month after that. I'm like, say that. I'll say nothing, brother. Yeah, how you, and then, yeah. and then I said this to one of the other comments. He's like, I'm, I said, like, dude, that guy you put me in touch with, what an asshole! Like, I was texting him trying to like bolster up the show, and then he like texts me back, say less. And he's like, dude, that just means like we're on the same page. That's all awesome, cool. We're vibing. I'm like what? And like that's exactly <laughs> what happened to me. And I was like, I was so offended. Yeah. And then I found out it was just like, no, we're vibing. Like, I get you. You don't have to say a word more and waste any breath because I'm with you. Yeah. And I was like, that was not how, like, I mean, if I said say less to Sister Doreen in school, like, that yeah. is the last thing I ever said, <laughs> you know, like, so like, those are some of those things that it's like, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's funny perception and all of that. But yeah, I'm, um, I stand hip with all of the lingo. Yes, um, because indeed. The, because how people perceive things is important, not what you meant to say. It's how it's perceived, you know, and that's, you know, and that's, that's, that's the reality of things. People can only handle so much. 80 year olds in a library at 2 p.m. on a Sunday, <laughs> you know, can only handle because that's what I know. Mark noticed about that show. Um when he pulled out that joke book that he has, uh, I forget the other guy who wrote it with him, but the jokes are great, but that's what they want. Like, that's what that crew wants. That's your, like your uncle Louie yeah, asking yeah. you to pull your, pull your finger last Thursday at, at Thanksgiving <laughs> dinner. Like they wanted those. They wanted like, they yo, did, they, three guys walk into a bar. They did start yeah. really, uh, Perking up, yeah, perking up. When it was they really, good. that was the loudest laughs. Cause that's what they wanted. They wanted, yeah. they, they didn't want, you know, like I see with my mom, my mom, she's like 70 now, pushing 70. And like, you know, she was a sharp woman. Like I said, got a second master's degree in nursing school all while trying to raise me. And uh, she was a smart lady, but you give her a Comcast remote now and she loses her mind. And it's just like, you can see that like when you get to an age, your brain is just kind of like, listen, I'm fatigued. Like we've been running this marathon. So like, you know, sometimes you kind of just want to play checkers, not chess. Right, and right. I think that's where they were. It was like, you need, you know, so even though as an artist and an entertainer, like it, it kills you to tell those kind of jokes because they don't, you can't, but that's sometimes what a crowd like that wants. And you know what? I'm there to entertain them. And so that's what I had learned from Mark was like, Hey, I'm, I'm here to entertain them. And that was entertainment. And what was it, but yeah, but when people talk about the movies that they pick, Tom Hanks, I'm sure, you know, when he thinks back some of those movies, it's not like the riveting. Like I watched uh, Captain Phillips the other day or whatever. I'm like, wow, powerful of a, a performance he gave in that one, even though it didn't seem like right, it wasn't right. didn't have the performance like big. Everybody remembers big. He wasn't like winning an Academy Award not big, even though it was a fun movie. It didn't have the gravitas of something like, you know, some of those others he's done. But 
you know, you don't always get to do those ones. You don't always get to, you know, you gotta, it's like Picasso also painted a bowl of fruit. You know what I mean? Like, right, right, right. so sometimes you paint a bowl of fruit and sometimes you get Guernica, you know? So, you uh, make cubism. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you just have to, you just have to kind of keep plugging away and then you get the opportunities to do that. And that's, you know, it's like anything. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. So, yeah. Well, man, dude, I, I think you're awesome, man. And uh, I can't wait till you come back to New York area. We got to get you at Governor's. I would yeah. love that. Yeah. I think we could make that happen, man. Probably in the new year, we could uh, get a show going. I know a lot of guys who produce shows out there in the, in the giggle room and on the main stage, too. And oh, maybe, great. Yeah. And hey, Rick Adana's always coming through, too. So. Yeah. Yeah. I figured that'll happen. I, I got on with this uh, board teacher's comedy tour. So. Uh, I, I haven't gotten my dates yet, but we have like 30 some dates between like February and, and, and May. So it's like, which is gonna be kind of cool. Cause it's like, uh, can I, you know, I'll be traveling to like Missouri on like a Friday, Saturday, and then back in the classroom on Monday. So it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. So I, uh, uh, but that's going to give me a lot of opportunity to get out there and keep, keep kind of working. And, and I think that's going to give me the push to, by summertime or whatever, be, be ready to come up and, and, and take New York by storm and kind of really hone my craft. Yeah, man. So, Jay, yeah. thanks so much. T tell everybody uh, where they could find you, follow you, see some of your stuff and all that good. Stuff. Yeah, it'd be great. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm on all of the cool kid platforms as uh Jay Yoder comedy. So it's J A Y Y O D E R comedy, um, TikTok, Instagram, uh, and uh, Facebook. So I post every day. I do a lot of little reels on uh, a lot of teacher and parent stuff and then post a lot of my shows there. Uh, so that's the best way to kind of get in touch with me because then you could get to my website from there and some of that other stuff. Um, but yeah, I just, like I said, I get picked up by this uh, board teachers. Uh, so boardteachers.com is a great site for teachers who want to, you know, get memes and kind of commiserate and they, they put out really good articles and they do podcasts and now they're doing a comedy tour. So I'm excited to be uh, on their roster and going to be traveling uh quite a bit this spring so check me out there as well awesome man say less man no <laughs> say less <laughs> bet